Okay, we will get started. So we were discussing about uh, Lagrange multiplier theorem in the previous class and the setting is as follows. Uh, Right, and we were talking about equality constraint problem, so the setting was as follows. I want to minimize f of x such that h of x is equal to 0, right, and uh, we had made the following assumption about x star, which is a candidate optimal solution to this particular problem. So we said, well, that uh, the Lagrange multiplier theorem was if x star is local minimum and gradient h1 of x star hm of x star are linearly independent then there exists lambda star in Rm such that uh, gradient f of x star plus gradient h of x star lambda star is equal to 0, okay? And we, we realized that uh, there is a geometric significance of this particular result which is uh, at x star well I'll let all of you write it even though you will already have it in the notes Okay. What was the geometric significance of this result? Well, the gradient of f at x star is a vector and this vector would lie in the plane spanned by gradient of f, spanned by these linearly independent vectors. Okay, so these linearly independent vectors are going to span a hyperplane in this high dimensional space x in Rn, right? And m is less than n. So they will span a uh, a, a hyperplane in this particular in this higher dimensional space and the gradient of f at x star will lie in that plane okay and the second order so this is the first order necessary condition and the second order necessary condition uh, is defined as follows uh, we define v of x star as d that are orthogonal to the plane spanned by these vectors. So, gradient of h i x star transpose d is equal to 0 for all i in 1 to m, okay. And the second order necessary condition was that d transpose is greater than or equal to 0. For all d in uh, Vx star. Okay. So we proved this result, at least the first order necessary condition, we proved it using the penalty approach, wherein we put a penalty on violating the constraint and looked at the unconstrained minimization problem and as we take the penalty going to infinity we get the first order necessary condition as a uh, as a direct result of that limit okay and the second order necessary condition can also be obtained in a similar fashion so what is this set v of x star it's the set of all directions d that are orthogonal to the plane 
spanned by these vectors okay so if we if i want to draw a a figure so this is my h1 of x equal to 0 this is my h2 of x equal to 0 they need not be convex function they can be any arbitrary nonlinear function okay and this is my this is my uh, set that satisfies both h1 of x equal to 0 and h2 of x equal to 0 and i look at vectors that are okay let's say this is my x star this blue point is my x star so i look at gradient of h1 x star i look at gradient of h2 x star right and what is this plane spanned by these two vectors that will be a plane of this sort right and v of x star would be normal to this plane so v of x star are first order variations that satisfy the constraint okay so v, this will be my this will be my v of x star okay and this too so if you move in this direction v of x star you will be very close to the constraint set of h1 of x equal to 0 and h2 of x equal to 0 okay but remember you will not be on the you may if you move in the direction of d you may or may not be within the constraint set so to give you an example suppose your constraint set was a circle and this is your x star your d will be this will be your d and this will be your d and if you move in the direction of d from x star you will be very close to the circle but you will not be at the circle itself okay so these are first order variations of your constraint set is that is that clear any question so far yes this part so what is d d is orthogonal to the entire uh, vectors gradient of h1 gradient of h1 x star gradient of h2 x star all the way up to gradient of h m x star so let's look at this example where you you have only one constraint you are optimizing something over a circle okay and it's a non convex set as you can as you can clearly see so let's look at this uh, look at this circle and let me say this is my x star okay so what is gradient of h1 at x star that's this is my gradient of h1 x star right it's the outward normal from this from this plane uh, or from this surface so that's gradient of h1 x star so what is v x star v x star would be this this will be my d and this will be my d okay so my v of x star is either moving in this direction or moving in this direction so let's say i move uh, from x star i move in this direction okay that's part of the first order feasible direction so if i move along this direction let's say i come here okay i take a small step in this direction d which is in v x star you see i'm not on the surface anymore okay in the previous case wherever we were taking a step in any direction feasible direction we were always within the constraint set if you remember from chapter 2 we were trying to minimize a function over this convex set right and we were talking about feasible direction so if this is my x star i move in the direction of d we are always within the set itself okay that's not the case anymore here okay so i am standing at x star i move in the direction of d i go out of the set but the distance is very very small okay it's of the order of epsilon square okay and what i'm saying is well since the distance is very very small your second order necessary condition should hold so this should be greater than or equal to 0 okay and it comes out from the same result 
Okay, we looked at the first order necessary condition for the penalty approach. If you look at the second order necessary condition for the penalty approach, you will arrive at this result. Is that clear? Okay. So today I want to talk about, this was just a recap of what we did in the previous class, but because it's an important result, I want all of you to know both geometrically what's happening and mathematically how do you prove what the intuition suggests. Okay. Any question? Okay. So now I want to talk about sufficiency condition. Okay. This was necessary condition. So now I want to talk about sufficient condition. And in order to introduce the sufficient condition, I want to stop writing all these, uh, these uh, equations. And I want to define something, a quantity, which is called Lagrangian. Okay, and my Lagrangian is defined in this fashion, L of x comma lambda equals to f of x plus lambda transpose h of x, and you can also define it as f of x plus h of x transpose lambda, okay? Whichever way you like, okay? I'm just writing it in one form in this way, and the other form would be this way. So what is the first order necessary condition? So this is known as Lagrangian. So in this notation, my first order necessary condition is uh, L gradient of x, L x star lambda star is equal to zero. And second order necessary condition is uh, D transpose okay this is the compact way of writing the same result, the grand multiplier theorem. Okay, remember that this gradient is only with respect to x, and this uh, second gradient is only with respect to x. Okay, so you're not taking any gradient with respect to lambda star, uh, but of course you know that h of x is equal to zero, so. So you automatically have gradient of lambda L x star lambda star is equal to zero. Okay, this but this condition is trivial. Okay, this one is the non-trivial condition. This automatically holds because you are in the constraint set. Okay, what is the gradient of L with respect to lambda? Any thoughts? H of x, right? Gradient of L with respect to lambda is H of x. So that's what I'm saying, that gradient of lambda, gradient with respect to lambda of the Lagrangian is trivially equal to zero because that means H of x star is equal to zero. And as we have written, x star is a local minimum, so it definitely satisfies the constraint. Okay, so this part is trivial, follows from the definition itself, these are the non-trivial conditions. How many of you have heard the term Lagrangian before? You know, it's also used, Lagrangian is also used uh, in, uh, in physics, right, for some uh, mechanics or dynamics kind of problem. I've forgotten all that, okay, it's, it's whatever, 12 years ago, okay, but uh, but Lagrangian is used there. I remember vaguely from my physics class that we've used something called Lagrangian there. Maybe some of you will remember, especially those who are undergrads. There are only three in this class, okay? Undergrads are minority in this class, okay? So, any other question? Any question on this? No? So let's talk about sufficient condition.
Oh well, you know, let's let's do an example first. Or maybe let's do sufficient condition first. <coughs> Let x bar lambda bar in R n cross R M be such that uh, gradient of X gradient of L okay so gradient with respect to X vanishes gradient with respect to lambda vanishes at x bar lambda bar and d transpose x x l of x bar lambda bar d is strictly positive for all d in v x bar d not equal to 0 then x bar is local minimum and lambda bar is the corresponding Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so the difference is here second order necessary condition says greater than equal to 0 sufficiency condition says strictly greater than 0 for all d not equal to 0 by the way this is a strict local minimum Okay, it's a strict local minimum and lambda bar is the corresponding Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so in the first order necessary condition remains the same. Okay, no difference whatsoever. Remember that I'm not making an assumption that x star or x bar is a local minimum, right? That's why it's a sufficient condition. If x star lambda bar satisfies these conditions, then we are guaranteed that it's a local minimum, just like we did it for the uh, unconstrained optimization problem. Okay, so first order necessary condition is the same as first order sufficient condition. The second order necessary condition is not the same. You have greater than equal to zero here, and we are strictly greater than zero here. Okay, that's the only difference. And of course, you have to have d not equal to zero. So let's try and apply this sufficient condition on a particular. Any question on this? No. So let's apply it to a to an example. I want to minimize minus x1, x2 plus x2, x3 plus x3, x1 subject to x1 plus x2 plus x3 
equal to 3. Okay. So the first thing that we want to do is, uh, uh, I don't know whether a solution to this problem exists or not. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is apply the necessary condition to identify a feasible solution, right? A potential potential solution. So, so let's do that. So if x star, so the first step one is use first order necessary condition. So that's, uh, let, let me define L of x comma lambda, that's minus x1, x2 plus x2, x3 plus x3, x1 plus lambda multiplied by x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus 3, okay? This is my Lagrangian. So the first thing that I have to do is gradient of L with respect to x should be equal to 0 at x star lambda star, okay? By the way, uh, re the fact that gradient of h has to be linearly independent is trivially satisfied here because gradient of h at any x is 1, 1, 1, which is linearly independent, okay? It's not 0, 0, 0, so it's not a trivial constraint. Uh, so regularity or uh, the fact that gradient of h has to be uh, 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 linearly independent uh, set of vectors, it's trivially satisfied. We have only one constraint here, okay? So let's look at the first derivative with respect to x. So that says minus, so I'm going to do, that's equal to minus x2 star minus x3 star plus lambda star equal to zero, okay? So then I have to do it with respect to x2 What is the derivative? Minus x1 star minus x3 star plus lambda star is equal to 0. Minus x3, no, x1 star minus x2 star plus lambda star is equal to zero. And I also know <coughs> is equal to three. So what would be the what would be the solution? So you can solve this problem at home, okay? And you will you will get at this solution. Okay, so that's a candidate. This is a candidate solution. I'm not claiming that this is optimal. This is. candidate optimal solution.
Why is it a candidate solution and not a solution? Who can answer that? Yeah. It only satisfies the first order necessary condition. Okay, even if I so let's let's try and see whether it satisfies the sufficient condition or not. So what is my V of X V of X star that is D such that gradient of H at X star transpose D is equal to zero. What does that mean? D such that what is gradient of H at X star? One one one. So that's D one plus D two plus D three is equal to zero. Okay, and what is my second derivative? L at x star lambda star. So that would be zero, negative one, negative one, negative one, zero, negative one, negative one, negative one, one. Sorry, zero. Okay, so this comes by. Remember, the second derivative of this is going to be equal to zero. So we are only doing the second derivative of this. Okay, if it had x square term or x cube term or x one x two terms, then these term will also participate here. But because we don't have higher order terms of x's there, so we, it doesn't feature in the second derivative of l. So all we are doing is the second derivative of this part, okay, and the second derivative of this part is equal to zero, okay. So that's given by this matrix form. So let's multiply it by d. What do I get? Minus d two minus d three minus d one minus D three minus D one minus D two. So this implies D transpose is equal to minus D one D two plus D three minus D two Okay. So if I want to prove sufficient condition, I have to prove that this term is strictly positive for all d not equal to zero, and d satisfying d1 plus d2 plus d3 equal to zero. So how should we do that? Okay, so let's see. Uh, I know that d1 plus d2 plus d3 equal to zero, so I can write d1 equals to minus d2 minus d3. So d1 square equals to minus d1 d2 plus d3. Is it clear? Right. So d1 plus d2 plus d3 equal to zero. So d1 equals minus d2 minus d3. So d1 square equals minus d1. D two plus D three, and this is exactly equal to this. And you do this, you do the same thing for D two in terms of D one and D three, and you get this expression, and you get this expression. So this implies that D transpose second derivative of L D is equal to minus, no, not minus, D one square plus D two square plus D three square. And so, what happens if d is not equal to zero? This is strictly positive. If d is in d x star, d greater than d not equal to zero.
any question okay and now what can I say what can I say about X star it's the optimal solution it's a local minimum right I can say that it's a local this candidate that I came up with using the first order necessary condition is indeed an optimal solution because it satisfies first order sufficiency condition which is the same as first order necessary condition and the second order sufficiency condition which says that D transpose second derivative of L with respect to X evaluated at X star lambda star multiplied by D given by this expression which is strictly positive if D is in VX star and D is not equal to 0. So second order SOSC satisfied. So that's a locally optimal solution. And remember I'm saying that this is a local optimal. This is locally an optimal solution. How do I guarantee global optimality? How do I guarantee global optimality? convex okay if I can prove that this by the way this is not doesn't look like a convex problem okay uh, but if I can prove that this is a convex problem with a convex constraint then this is an optimal solution okay <coughs> so the constraint is convex but in order to prove that this is the objective function itself is convex you need to do some work okay you need to prove that you can write it in a form so that you can prove that it is convex okay any question so as you can see no matter how the constraint set was if it was a circle or sphere okay something of this form you can still follow the same procedure okay follow the same procedure and you can prove whether the solution is optimal or not right uh, or a locally optimal or not so that's why Lagrange multiplier theory is so powerful because you don't need the constraint set to be convex anymore okay you can have non-convex constraint of this sort and you can still find an optimal solution or uh, uh, a candidate for optimal solution by solving these set of equations yes Oh, this one? Yes. So, how would I prove that this objective function is convex? Let me delete this part. Right. All I need to prove is the second derivative of this f of x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in Rn. Okay? then it is convex where f of x is this this is something we studied in the first first uh, in our first lecture so go back and review the first lecture and you will see that we proved this uh, this result well not proved it we recalled it from our previous uh, courses but that's the that's the uh, uh, condition for convexity so if your second derivative is positive definite it's a convex problem but it has to be it has to be positive definite for all x in rn okay but if you have a constraint problem all you need to prove is within the con over the constraint this is convex okay or in a region around the convex set it is convex any other question okay Oh, so the next result that I want to talk about is sensitivity theorem. It's a very powerful result and it sort of gives you an explanation for what Lagrange multiplier really means. Okay, so sensitivity. theorem so 
So sensitivity theorem says that X star lambda star satisfy sufficient condition for optimality okay so the second sufficiency condition that we mentioned uh, assume that x star lambda star satisfies that and we also assume that x star is regular x star is regular which means uh, that is gradient of h1 x star gradient of hm x star is uh, linearly independent or are linearly independent okay so i'm assuming that the gradients of h1 to hm are linearly independent at x star and of course uh, the function is uh, twice differentiable and so on whatever smoothness condition you want to endow on both the constraints as well as on the function okay so assume that it is smooth and let's say i am going to define pu as minimum of fx x is in rn and h of x is equal to u okay so now h of x is not equal to 0 h of x is equal to u what is the dimension of u u is an rm right because there are m constraints so sensitivity theorem says so this implies so first first result is of course that p is differentiable and the second result is gradient of p with respect to u is equal to minus lambda of lambda star of u okay so you look at the lagrange multiplier for this minimization problem that's lambda star of u and the change in the optimal value of the function if you take the gradient you will see that it's equal to negative of lambda star okay okay so in particular if you know what lambda star is when u is equal to 0 you know what lambda star is and let's say you want to uh, you want to change the constraint by a little bit and you want to know how much is the the optimal value going to change so you can easily estimate that by this expression so if you look at this particular problem let's say you assume this is x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals to 3 plus u okay u is a small number here and we call this as p of u okay let's say my u was equal to 0 0.1 okay so my question is what is p of 0 0.1 minus p of 0 okay p of 0 is the optimal value at this x star at this x star what should it be approximately equal to any thoughts so remember the gradient of p with respect to u is negative of lambda star so we know that from sensitivity theorem we know that gradient or dp over du is equal to minus 
2 because lambda star is equal to 2 okay at u equal to 0 so what is p 0 0.1 that will be minus 2 into 0 0.1 equals minus 0 0.2 right so that's lambda star sorry minus lambda star multiplied by the change delta u okay so sensitivity theorem is very very important because if you want to know how is your optimal value going to change if you change the constraint a little bit it can give you an a very accurate estimate because of the because of this this result. Lambda star, is with lambda star will change with you, right? But because of the smoothness condition, you know this function is smooth, this constraint is smooth, so lambda star will be a smooth function of u. So it won't change much with small changes in u. Yes. Oh, so 0 0.1 is e u is equal to 0 0.1, right. right? So that's what it is. Sorry. So that's a multiplication or a function? So this is an exact relationship, okay? Gradient of p with respect to u is equal to minus lambda star. Now in this case, what is p of 0 0.1 minus p of 0 over 0 0.1 minus 0? What is this equal to? It's the derivative, right? Well, approximately equal to the derivative. dp over du at u equal to 0. Oh, I got, it. got it? Got it. Okay. So, that's this, so this 0 0.1, so this is equal to minus 2. This is equal to minus 2, so this 0 0.1 goes here, and what you get is negative 0 0.2. Any other question? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was, yeah. Arbitrarily yeah, you can no. take any number, yeah, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, some small number, okay, because as you move far away, uh, this result would become inapproximate. This right. approximation would become uh, very coarse, and you will not get an accurate result. Right, because it's evaluated at u equals Yeah, yeah. This is the forward difference formula, right? It's supposed to be e almost equal to dp over du, but as you move away, if you make it 0 0.5, this approximation is very coarse, okay, not very accurate approximation. Okay, any other question? So in particular, if, uh, so uh, suppose lambda star is lambda of zero, lambda star of zero, right? and your u is very small, then p of u minus p of 0 is approximately equal to minus lambda star transpose u. Okay? So that's what, that's what we are doing here. Okay? But for, for arbitrary dimension, okay, you can keep changing. If you have five constraints, you can keep changing the values of that constraint a little bit and you will see that it's always equal to minus lambda star u. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to cover the proof because the proof uses what is known as implicit function theorem. The proof uses implicit function theorem. It's a fairly standard result in, uh, in uh, real analysis. But I guess many of you would not have seen it, so I don't want to introduce that in the class. Uh, but uh, those of you who know implicit function theorem, you can go and read the proof in the book. It's fairly uh, straightforward, nothing complicated. Okay. So now my next uh, topic is inequality constraint problem. So we looked at equality constraint problem where the constraint had an equality constraint. So now let's look at the inequality constraint problems.
by the way, you might be thinking that these are all theoretical topics, may not be useful, but uh, a couple of classes later on, we'll start talking about solving problems of this type uh, using uh, different classes of methods, and all those methods will base, I mean, the entire theoretical foundation is based on what we are studying in these classes. So these are really helpful from algorithmic perspective as well. So okay, and the idea is I want to minimize f of x. X is in R n. H of x is equal to zero. G of x is less than or equal to 0, h is a function from Rn to Rm, g is a function from Rn to Rr. How should we go about finding a, so what is, what would be a necessary condition? So if x star is local minimum, then what? So think about what, how do I formulate this? So we know what the solution is for the equality constraint problem. Now we have inequality constraints, so how should we come up with a necessary condition? What would be a quick way? Any thoughts? Okay, so let me first define the set of active constraints A of X. It's the J such that GJ of X is equal to zero. Okay, so this is a subset of one to R. So we have R inequality constraints. So AX is the set of indices. Uh, where gj of x becomes equal to zero, okay? We use this also in manifold suboptimization method, right? If you remember, we had used uh, we had used this idea to figure out the set of active constraints. So this is what this is the set of set of active constraints at x. Okay, so what condition should I, would I need uh, to convert? So let's look at this problem. Uh, minimize f of x such that, so I know that, let's say I know that x star is a local minimum. So I'm formulating another problem, h of x is equal to zero, gj of x is equal to zero for all j in A, x star. Okay, so, so every j, every j, for every j that is in the active constraint, that is an active constraint at x star, I am going to set gj of x equal to 0 and I am going to drop all other constraints that weren't active at x star. And what my question is, if x star is a local minimum to this problem, would x star be also a local minimum to this problem? So this is my problem 2, p2, this is my p1. So my question is, question is, if 
x star local minimum of p1 then x star local minimum of p2 what do you think i need your views i want to prove this by majority vote views questions comments so if x star is a local minimum to this problem would x star be a local minimum to this problem no thoughts no views no comment not necessarily not necessarily why okay that's good i have the votes <laughs> <laughs> okay so you are just voting but you don't know what how would you argue it okay yeah we're considering only uh, active constraints in this situation right shouldn't it satisfy as well because the other case is kind of a more loose case that's right So that's what your argument is. Yes, so I would say yes. You would say yes. Okay, so I have one yes, one no. Okay, so so the vote is not in strict majority. <laughs> I need someone else to say yes. Okay, so it's two is to one, so I can say okay, it's proved. Okay, so so here is the idea. Okay, we had mentioned it in the previous time that if min of fx over x1 okay you are solving this problem and instead you solve min of fx x and x2 okay let's say you are uh solving so if x2 x2 is a subset of x1 so if x2 is a subset of x1 and well you know i hadn't formulated it like this but what i had formulated it was x1 intersection x2 and i was looking at no so this is the venn diagram that you would remember this is my x1 this is my x2 and i'm trying to solve a function in this set okay and i don't know how to solve it so instead i solve the function over this set and i get a solution in the intersection right and what we had argued in the previous uh, one of the previous classes was then so if if this is my x star x star and if uh, x star solves minimum of fx such that x is in x1 then it also solves minimum of fx x is in x1 intersection x2 okay so it's the same idea here where i look at only those constraints that are active okay and i remove all the inactive constraints because they are not active so it means they are not really participating in this optimization problem in any way okay and if i remove those constraints and i look at this problem p2 what i have is if x star is a local minimum of p1 then x star is also a local minimum of p2 so the answer is yes okay and it does need some amount of thinking so it's not uh it's once you look at it first time it may not be obvious i completely understand it but it needs some amount of thinking and you will be able to convince yourself that this is indeed true because of this result okay you're trying to solve a function 
you're sol trying to solve a minimization problem over this set x1 and it turns out that x star actually lies in x1 intersection x2 okay so then x star would also solve this particular problem yeah how do you know it's going to fall in that intersection how do i know well you won't know but th that is what i'm doing i'm removing the constraints that are not active okay and all i'm claiming is well x star if x star is an optimal solution to, uh, locally optimal to this then x star is also a locally optimal to this because the constraints are active so you are only looking at the active constraints the inactive constraints are not really participating in the optimization problem right and uh, to give you another a uh, geometric picture let's say you are trying to solve an optimization problem uh in this region okay if you if your optimal solution if your local minimum is here okay and i move the boundary a little bit it doesn't matter right it would still remain a local solution however if the solution was here and i move the boundary the solution is going to change right so now if i assume that this boundary was a constraint set instead of an inequality constraint it was an equality constraint it would still remain an optimal solution because if you look at the vicinity of this x star the entire constraint set is kind of met okay you have this entire constraint the the fact that it is local minimum on this line is uh if it is local minimum in th on this line then it also means it's a local minimum in this region okay uh because you originally started with an inequality constraint but x star actually was an active constraint it was an active constraint for certain number of inequality constraints okay so uh so it will it will so if you remove those inactive constraints and make sure that you only have active constraints x star would still remain an optimal solution to this particular problem okay so if if you are not convinced by this argument you should go back and try to think about it and try to argue it in your own head because until you argue it in your own head you won't you may not believe that this solution this actually holds in 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 most of not in most but in all optimization problems of this type okay and then with this uh, background we will kick we'll start the discussion about inequality constraints in the next class there are lectures never uploaded on